Hello. Hello. Welcome to Salem the Podcast. We are your hosts and favorite Salem tour guides. My name is Jeffrey Lilly. And I'm Sarah Black. Thanks for tuning in. Today, we're going to be talking to the official magician of Salem, Anton James. Welcome to Salem the Podcast. Hey, thank you so much for having me here. This is really exciting. You're our first guest. We're all sitting here, all, all smiles and chit-chat. Very exciting. It's, uh, it's exciting. So, Anton... As Jeffrey said, you are the official magician of Salem. Is that is that your business? What you do? That's a title? Is that? Yes. So I've been a magician my whole life. In fact, my earliest memories involved learning magic. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Like the very earliest memories. How did, like, mine's like, you know, watching TV and eating cereal. Like, how, what, what were you? My earliest memory is sitting on the couch in the house that I grew up in uh, with my father next to me and him reading to me the Mickey Mouse book of magic. Are, uh, are you still part of the Mickey Mouse school of magic? Or? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> always, you know, but uh, that was where, you know, it kind of started was him reading this book with me and uh, there was all sorts of fun illustrations, but you'd read about what a particular piece of magic was and then you would maybe do an arts and crafts project and actually build something, make something. So we were making like magic wands out of uh, construction paper and stuff like that at the house. Um, but those are, yeah, my very earliest memories that I have. So and that's, it's always been a part of my life, basically. That's pretty cool. I don't think there's a lot of us who can, like, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up, you know? And actually stick with it. Yeah. Like, follow through. Yeah. So that's, congratulations, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, no, they, it is a, it's very special to me. And I was fortunate because I started doing shows uh, very early on in my life. You know, a lot of kids lose an interest in magic uh, around the time they become teenagers, yeah. right? They become interested in other things. But because I was performing, I didn't have the opportunity to lose that interest. I had to keep, you know, focusing on the next show and that sort of thing. And so it's it just stuck with me. Performing can be pretty addictive, as yeah, we all know. Yeah. You get that, that crowd response and, and you eat that up. Yeah, absolutely validation for a job well done right so you've gone from mickey mouse magic uh <laughs> to, to being the official magician of salem yeah yep how does one become the official magician oh. is that a license that one would have to acquire because okay, we, we have to get licensed there's a test by the city and uh that sort of thing yeah so basically i've been doing shows in salem you know, my whole life I was on, you know, local access TV a lot, you know, from the age of 13 every wow. year, sometimes multiple times a year. And then I would also, you know, anytime somebody would ask me to like hop in on a community event or something like that, I would be there for that. And then one day I, I got a phone call and it was a combination of people that had been talking about it. And they said, you know, you're, you're going to be the city's official magician. And I was like, that doesn't even sound real, to be honest. <laughs> so I was kind of like blown away because having been born in Salem, that's an extremely special thing. And I think the better part of a year went by and then I got it. And, and nothing. And yeah, and I was like... Wait, okay. Was that a scam? Or like <laughs> no, no, I was just like, you know, it just sounded, it sounded too unusual and exciting to be... Real. Yeah. And then I got another call and they said, um, you know, we'd like to have you at the state house in Boston. Um, For like a ceremony? <laughs> but Sarah's yeah. eyes just went like <laughs> five times larger than they normally are. Yeah. I'm just, I, I'm trying to imagine like what this initiation would look like. Yeah. So it was really special. And, um, you know, I wish I had, I, I almost brought it with me, but it was a picture of my father and I that day. But what happened was, uh, you know, I was asked to be at the state house on a certain day. And that was pretty much all the information I was given Ooh. day and time. Right? Surprise. And so did, I did they send a car? They did not. <laughs> no, no. I, uh, you know, I just appeared on the front steps. And, like, <laughs> like magic. Yeah, I exactly. And so, but my family was there. And then unexpectedly to me, some friends of mine from out of state actually flew in. Oh, that's awesome. And so we're all there together and we go into the state house and I introduce myself and I, you know, explain who I am and why I'm here. And they're like, Oh, we have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Wait, what? I know, I know. My stomach just dropped I, for you. I, it was like, okay, Ooh. interesting. And, you know, and uh, so we, we go and, you know, they send us in the direction of a couple different people to talk to. And so, you know, those people also had no idea what oh I was my there. God. And so by, I suddenly uh, meet 
the right person and I begin to say, hi, I'm Anton. And they go, oh, Anton, we're so glad you're here. And I knew like right then that, okay. You're like, it's, okay. It's going on. It's going to happen. Yeah, something's going to happen here. And I really honestly, up until this moment, was still skeptical about the whole thing. I was told that there was a, a document they were going to present me with, with this title on it. And my last name is Andreessen. And it's notoriously spelled incorrectly. People mm-hmm. spell it as Anderson. Oh. Right? And so I kind of off to the side, I said, hey, is that document here? Can I see it? And mm-hmm. he said, the, the guy brought me into a room, just him and I, and there it is. And it's it was a little, very large, bigger than my diploma, actually. And uh, yeah, there it was, my name spelled correctly Cor- on it. Oh, they got it right. Yeah, they got it right. And I was awesome. just, and like, when I tell you that, like, that is a thing my grandfather, you know, used to say, he's like, people misspelling your name is going to follow you your whole life. And then he passed away. And we went to go get the um, the pamphlets for the funeral. <laughs> was it spelled wrong? His name no. was spelled wrong. No. So, 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 so not... It, it follows you. Yeah, it follows you into the afterlife. Into the, afterlife. Into the next life as well. And so the, anyway, so when I saw that the name was there correctly and I saw the official magician of Salem, those words on it, I was just, it was like so surreal. And then they brought us into, I won't, remember the exact name of it, but it's one of the rooms where they make these kinds of announcements and Mm -hmm. resolutions and stuff. Very big, impressive space. And there was a group randomly of like, it's like me, my family, my friends, and then like 200 students just that came in. They they were just touring the rotunda. Or something like that. And so they were there to like see what some official business looks like. And They got more than they bargained for. Yeah, basically they, you know, read the resolution and, you know, recognizing the contributions of doing magic in the city of Salem and making magical memories for the citizens. And they said, we're going to point you out and we want you to step forward. And so I did. And all these students who I've never seen before in my life are standing (laughs) there clapping. (laughs) And it's like, if that applause lasted two minutes, it like felt like forever. It was surreal, like out of a movie. It was probably only 10 seconds, but it felt like it was just so... I not, none of that was what I was expecting when I went in there that day. Um, that was that. And then, you know, everybody, I did some magic there for everybody afterwards. Of course. And, of course. And uh, they took us out actually onto the balcony of the state house overlooking the commons. See, that's where I thought they were going to like declare you is up there, <laughs> like yeah, right? over the balcony. <laughs> I remember, you know, my, my dad, he, so my family has uh, my a bit of a history with doing business at the state house. Um, my mother's mom, my grandmother was a secretary for, I believe, Dukakis. Our family had been in and out of the state house quite a bit. My dad says to me, he goes, I've been in every part of the state house, but I've never been on the balcony. <gasps> and so that was like a really special uh, like you moment got him for there. Me. Yeah, yeah. And like, you know, my dad's such an accomplished guy. It was like really special and was really exciting for everybody. And then the follow up is just that, you know, about a month later, the following month, um, they recognized me at Salem City Council. Um, so I was recognized by the state and the city. Did Did you get blessed by the, the stick? Do you uh, know what I'm talking about? No, what? tell what? me about it. <clears throat> so uh, it's, it has a name and, and I, I, I'm blanking on it right now, but there is like an official uh, swearing in stick for the city councilors. Okay. It, it looks like this, like maybe chest high stick with like this troll head <laughs> on it. It's a legit thing. It's just been like a tradition, but it looks like this weird, like a wizard, like hand car. Like, ah, it's like, it's, but no, okay, that's fine. No, that's what they were hitting me with. That, yeah. no. <laughs> You're like, it, it, I remember that's what that was. Yeah. But I will say one thing that was interesting from that experience with the council was I was like an item on a very long agenda. They were they were doing some very serious business there Mm -hmm. and they were like maybe two hours behind schedule. You know, I'm waiting there with my family and what have you. And so it comes my time to enter the, the chambers there. They recognize me and. I had the opportunity to say a few words. So I just, you know, expressed my gratitude to the city council. And then I said, would you guys like to see some magic? (laughs) (laughs) And uh, the the city uh, councilor, the head of city council at the time goes, your fastest trick. (laughs) Because, again, they're way behind. So You can't say no. No, no, of course. And so I went around to uh, where she was in front of everybody and uh, did one piece of magic and everybody stood and started to clap. Mm-hmm. I quickly grabbed my nice new document and waved goodbye and left <laughs> as fast as I could, trying to exit on a high note. I didn't want to take more of their time. But that was a really cool, that was a um, a very like, 
you would call that a command performance where like you're in front of some important people and you only have this one opportunity to make sure it goes well. So I was very happy at it. Hopefully you, well. you gave them a story. They, they can be like, ah, oh, there's, there's this meeting. We did, it was great. And we had to, that, that's the goal. Yeah, actually I was doing, I did some magic with some money. And so there was lots of requests if I could like work on the budget. You, know, <laughs> just, you just made money up here. Yeah, yeah. I okay. was like, I don't, I, I, you know, that's, that's above me. I think I've so. seen you do that. I, if I, if I recall, there was a, a time. So when, would that make you the first? like the official first magician yeah, in Salem? So they created this position for you? Yeah, not unlike what they did for Lori Cabot, right? Where she's first the official, official witch, witch. Of, of Salem. And so not only that, though, in my research, you know, magic's an art form that goes back 5,000 years. And there doesn't appear to be, and if somebody listening knows any different, like, please reach out and tell me because I, I would love to know more about this. But I believe I'm the first official magician of a city ever Anywhere. recognized by the city and the state in oh, that. That's so cool long history so so it's a very special thing to me it's something that I feel weight of uh, responsibility towards actually because you know I love the art form of magic so much and I love Salem so much and what Salem stands for it you know is is really significant to me that I, I tr honor that t title and be a good steward of that title to the best of my ability so that's pretty cool I that's like wow. I love that you describe magic as an art form I don't think I've ever heard it described as such. I mean, when you say it, though, I'm like, oh, yeah. It makes sense. It's uh, a performance. Yeah, obviously. I actually would make the argument that magic is the most delicate art form that I'm aware of. Because whereas, like, if you understand, if you're looking at a painting, if you're listening to a singer, and you could know that, like, well, that singer didn't write those lyrics, you still can love the song. If you know, like, the types of paints that Van Gogh used to make a painting, it doesn't it doesn't take away from how great that piece of art is or the feeling it brings out in you. But if you're watching a magician and the person next to you goes, he has a second one of those things in his hand. It that totally, can ruin it the ruins entire it. illusion. So it's the only art form I know that you can shatter with a single sentence. I, uh, like, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I understand. I'm going to kind of have to disagree. Sure. I think it sometimes depends. Don't look at me like. You're disagreeing <laughs> with the official magician no, 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 of Salem no, 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 no. about magic. Because. <laughs> It may come down to the type of person. So the type of person who's going to tell you, oh, he's got another one of those hands, like, you're just an asshole. Well, like, of course there's going to be outliers. But I, if, if, if I go to a magic show and someone's like, yeah, he's got another one in his hand, I'm like, I don't care. Like, so, so you I, bring up a good point, I right? still want to see it. I, no one, okay, it's like I know it, it's an illusion. It, it's a mastery, the trickery, sleight of hand. We know, I may not know how it works, mm -hmm. but, like, I know how the game, that there is a game being played. And... I want to see that. I, I, I know that you're you're doing things and I'm not noticing things and you, you've got a skill and I'm here to see that skill. And, and he, he's got another one. Saying, Great, fine. I want to see the trick anyway. Show me again. Show me again. What else do you like? I, I don't care. You want to ruin it? Fine. I am still impressed. I am still intrigued. It is still magic and I still want to see it. And I, and I love that because that to me is like the connoisseur's opinion. Like somebody who like really, really knows magic can appreciate the skill and effort. I will relate it back to, I'll defend my original position <laughs> by saying this though, that a juggler uh -huh. practices and practices and practices and then comes out and shows the world the skill he's developed. Whereas yeah. a magician practices and practices and comes out and hides it. And the Ooh. reason why is because... <laughs> The goal of a magician, what I consider to be a magician, right? Like what my view on magic is, is the, the goal is to create a sense of wonder and astonishment for the audience. You know, when we're children, everything in the world is w astonishing and wonderful. And we look at the world every day uh, with a sense of wonder. And as we get older, that feeling becomes more and more rare, harder and harder to come by. And so I see my job as a magician is to give people the opportunity to experience that again. So at least through that lens, that's where the person in the audience shouting out, like, I don't know what he did, but he did it right then, uh, can destroy that piece of it. So although, yes, I agree completely with what you're saying. There is an appreciation for the skill. The skill itself is an art form. Uh -huh. But as far as the art of uh, creating a magical experience for people, I feel like that is very, very delicate. Um, that the difference between something that can like really hit and like make, you know, uh, uh, there's been a few things I've done and it's funny because it's hard to recreate it and make it consistent. But there are things where people in the audience might be brought to tears 
from something and it's and it's that sort of thing the right combination of things hitting just right in that moment Mm -hmm. that can bring somebody to a different place that's more than just entertainment and that's the thing that's so delicate and so hard to do if those elements are even a little bit off something that's really beautiful could come off as silly yeah it's just not going to translate yeah the same way so that's cool so you've had people cry out of like wonder and astonishment yeah because i do try to Include as much of my, um, you know, myself in what I do. And mm-hmm. so to try to create like a, a very human connection with the audience. And so sometimes that has come through in, in different settings where it's had like significant impact on people. And it's always a surprise to me when it happens, mm-hmm. but it does happen. And it's different than the, uh, you know, the usual, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, that, and obviously we all like applause, right, but right. some, you know, sometimes stunned <laughs> silence is, is just as beautiful as a reaction. And I really told that story up until that point, just as an excuse to hit the applause to do that was it. <laughs> on the soundboard. I was waiting. You're like, you know, I, I'm going to craft this whole narrative. Just, just thanks to get to the sound button. <laughs> we, I appreciated it. Yeah. Thank you. It was well Thank thought you. out. So <laughs> you said uh, that you're local to, you were born in Salem. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you, your dad was state house family. Your yeah, so I'm a New England boy through and okay. through, and born in Salem. And wherever I have lived in the world, I've always, you know, come back to the city every year. It will always be my home. And it will be, hopefully, you know, I'd, I'd like to be in the dirt in Salem one day. Yeah. You mm-hmm. Know? Mm-hmm. So, that's, so that, that's that's your foundation regardless of anything else mm-hmm. is and that's that's great like the official which city you know, is sort of in, literally in your blood you're like that's absolutely yep absolutely so it. and uh yeah I, I just see myself being here the rest of my life and and then beyond me your name will follow you <laughs> yeah right spelled rightly or wrongly yeah. Yeah. it will be there so so what's your favorite thing about salem so there's lots of awesome things about salem that are very obvious you know whether it's like the art community um i love the food i love the atmosphere i love the people but i think you know the thing that i love about it is the same reason why millions of people come here every year which is that salem has the essence of magic all around it like people Ooh, come the essence of magic people yeah are you uh, gonna look that up on godaddy right now no, <laughs> no, the of magic. <laughs> no, no. um so, but people come to Salem because they want a magical experience and that is what I want as much as I can have in my life, right? Is as much magic as possible. And so that's, I think, the thing I like most about Salem is it's such an uh, interesting, eclectic mix of things. There's always something kind of new and exciting to see that will kind of transport you somewhere else. So that's probably my favorite thing in a very literal sense is that yes, there is always an opportunity to experience magic in this city. So I think when I look at Salem in its totality and its history, I think the thing that I love about it is that Salem for me is very much a symbol and a metaphor for change in the sense that like it was a place where these very bad things happened and it's um, and people were killing each other out of fear And now it's a place where people's uniqueness is actually celebrated Mm -hmm. and, you know, you can have an official witch of the city. And so when you look at that amount of change that's happened, I think that's such a positive message. And I identify with that because I think one of the real metaphors of magic and being a magician is that we're all capable of powerful transformation and so that probably in a more philosophical sense is my favorite thing about Salem. So that, that's a, a, a oof, um, it's inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> it's, right? it's funny you say that because we we're going to be diving into this quite a bit on several of the episodes. This question. And we actually we talked about it in our last episode. Like, how do you go from such a tragic tale and, to and, bewitched the TV yeah. show? Like, how, how do we create this story and be able to educate folks on what happened here and do it in a way that is respectful to those that lost their lives. And I, I literally wrote it down, symbol and metaphor for change. I'm like, I think I'm going to be saying that a couple more times, if, if you don't Are mind. Are you going to sneak that into your tour? No, I, I mean, it's not, that's the way I feel about yeah. it, but it's like, that. It, that's to me what it is. So, and I think it's important because I think that things that are bad 
can become good and things that are good can become bad. Like it's a, it's, you know, things change over time. Salem, it's the same geographic location, but at a different time and the meaning of everything is completely different uh -huh. than uh, what it would have been in, you know, 1692. So, yeah. So speaking of witches, even mm -hmm. though there weren't any back then, <laughs> do you have a favorite witch or wizard? Are you referring to real or fictional? Ooh. Okay. Well, we actually had that argument so, <laughs> earlier. We couldn't decide. Like, as we're putting the questions together, it's like, I, I thought we should specify. And Sarah was like, no, just ask. I want to hear. I want to, yeah. you can choose anything. Yeah. Anyone. Okay. Um, well, let's, uh, I'll start with my favorite fictional and then I'll tell you my real one. So I would say probably my favorite fictional wizard or witch character would be Merlin. I always found nice. Merlin to be very okay. intriguing. I shouldn't, I, I, you say that, I'm like, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah, well, I mean, he's like the OG. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. you know, classic. And I appreciated his role as a um, guide and as sort of a guru for Arthur in the Arthurian legends. And so, yeah, I would have to go with, with Merlin for sure. And I was a, you know, big fan of... Uh, Sword in the Stone. Yeah, Ooh, a that's a good one. Once and Future King. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, just Merlin and his role. And have you ever heard of the idea of this, the first follower? Have you ever heard this idea? First follower? I have not. So, yeah, so somebody could have a, a crazy idea. Like, I'm going to go, uh, you know, do this this thing, whatever that might be. I'm going to I'm gonna start a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then the first follower is actually the person who gives that person some power. It's the person who says, I see what you're saying. I believe in it. Allow me to support that and be a part of it with you. And so that would be what Merlin was to Arthur. So as, as uh, iconic and powerful as Arthur was, a large part of that came from Merlin's support and guidance in those stories. So yeah, so Merlin would be my, my easy pick. Yeah, I like it. That's, that's uh, all, all the inspiration. You said fictional and non-fictional? Yeah, okay, yeah. So if I had to pick my favorite real uh, wizard, um, it's, and it's a very uh, sappy answer, but I have to give uh -huh. it, is uh, my dad. You know, So he is uh, a magician in the truest sense of the word. So what I mean by that is... You know, we're all familiar with the words abracadabra, mm -hmm. which is what I speak, I create. It's loosely, you know, there's diff some different variations of the translation, but it might be as I speak, so it is. You know, people have different uh, views on it. But mm -hmm. basically the sentiment of that phrase is, is that, you know, your words shape the world around you. And so my father, from a very young age, um, was able to empower me to understand that if I could very, very specifically tell myself what it was that I wanted and how I would accomplish those things that I could do them. And so that was probably, you know, if I could give any lesson to anybody, it would be that, that like, you know, you are capable of shaping and changing your future. You just have to get very specific about what you want that to be and how you want to get there. My father really is kind of an unbelievable character in the sense that like we, he, uh, we're, th movers historically my grandfather started a moving company my dad runs it my brother will take it over um but when my father received the business from his dad it was just like i believe two trucks at the time and my mm -hmm. father had a very serious vision for where he wanted to see it go what he wanted to see it do and he did that and he's done that time and time again in his life, whether it's with very small things like how he wants the holiday party to go <laughs> and like how he wants people to feel and what he wants that experience to be when they, you know, come to that party. And then he figures out how to do it. And so having seen that again and again and again in my life, it really cemented that into me to the point where when I was, you know, traveling or living in other places, I would meet people and there was one person I met who actually is one of the most successful people I know now, but he was um, an employee at a company and we had talked about, why don't you start your own business? And in his mind, that wasn't even a possible thing. He was like, well, don't you have to like be born into that? Or like, <laughs> he just didn't understand how you could do it. And then, you know, we, we had a great, very supportive network of friends and he had some insights and he's you know, done amazing, amazing things, but it really did blow me away. Like the, 
you know, I don't know what else to refer to it as. It's other like than the mental walls yeah, we limiting, put up. Yeah. Limiting beliefs. Or, and and it, I hate to even call it a limiting belief, but he had just not seen it. Right. He had not, he didn't have somebody in his life to, to demonstrate. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That demonstrated like, if you, you know, really believe in this, you can do it. And so I, I truly believe that if my father didn't instill that in me, it would have been very difficult for me to be a magician today because I would have not felt it was possible to make a living pursuing my passion. And I probably uh, would have a marketing job somewhere. So on, on my list of, of questions here, I also have a later down the line was going to be a, who inspires you? Who do you look up to? And like, what advice do you have? Yeah. I think and, we just got, and that. I just went through and I'm like, we're done with that one. <laughs> we're done with that one. So that, but that's good. That that's, that's uh, uh, inspirational as well. So credit to, to that lesson as you can also yeah, pass Thank you, that Dad. On. Pass your yeah. <laughs> pass our thanks along to your father because he may have inspired a couple other people too. Yeah. Anybody who has ever met him knows he's like a very one of a kind sort of guy, very hardworking and very driven. Um, but also has this kind of surprising creative side that not a lot of people see, but it comes through in things like, you know, when like the his, holiday party. Yeah. Like with his thoughtfulness <laughs> uh-huh. towards others, you know, and uh, it, it's, he doesn't make a big deal about that ever. So I don't think, I think a lot of people know him and don't know there's that layer yeah. to what he does. But um, you know, a lot of what he does in the moving world is about anticipating people's needs, you know, knowing what they're going to need before they even know they need it the job of a magician is very much the same thing it's like you know i know i have an event i know a couple details about the event and there are things that i have to think about that the person hiring me doesn't even know is going to be like a thing like where are the people going to be seated at the event what did they do right before right after you know what is what's the feeling or the tone that he wants everybody left off with at the end of what it is that i do so i have to anticipate all of those things and be ready and I've been in situations where people will book me to do a certain type of performance, and I can tell before I even get there that that is not going to be what's going to be the You're like best that, that's, thing. That's not what you want. Yeah, exactly. So you know, oftentimes I'll talk to them about it, or I'll just come prepared, and I'll be ready to you know make an adjustment last minute if that's what needs to happen. But yeah, again, all those that sort of anticipating people's needs is is a, a big part of what I do and a big part of what my dad passed on to me. So I'm, so I'm sure that looks a lot different now post COVID or in the midst of COVID as tour guides, as soon as lockdown went into place, of we, course, we, we are, we were not giving tours, yeah, then smaller groups. Yep. Eventually it opened up and we were, we went from having 50 people to 10 people. Mm. And that was a huge, huge difference. And of course we were masked as well. So, so we're it, outside you, and yeah. we're talking and one of the things, and, and this, this will probably bother me for the rest of my life is the, the amount of people like, well, I'm wearing this mask and they always pull it down to talk or talk and I can't, I can't mm. do this. I can't do this. Like, like, I have to do this for two hours, like, three times a day. Yeah. Mm. I am having to project to a group of people in a public space while like get, get off your, mm. but, but as a magician, I'm you, sure you've ran, yeah, run into your own snags. A lot of like clo- car tricks, magic. How does that? So that was, yeah, really intense because you're right. Like, you know, whether I'm doing stuff for like small intimate groups or I'm in front of a room full of people, all that stuff had to grind to a halt. I actually had like a year's worth of bookings fall off the calendar in like two weeks at the very beginning of it. And it was like painful, you know, it was hard to understand what was going on. And so about a month went by and it was clear to me that we didn't know what was happening and that we didn't know when the, where the finish line would be to this. And I still think we are not really sure today. Oh no, um, we're, we're, we're still in the thick of it. Yeah. yeah. So, and so when I saw after that first month, kind of the way things were going, I said, I started thinking about what I still could do. And I said, you know, uh, I'm going to figure out a way to, make something happen here during this time. So I started thinking about, like I mentioned before, I had been on local access TV when I was uh, younger and pretty much all of those appearances, I always tried to develop something that was interactive where the audience at home could participate in the magic, you know, even though they're watching from home, you know, that they could do magic through the TV screen. And that idea always really appealed to me. So what I kind of did was I went back to my notes and my thoughts about those older shows And I put together like a best of list of all of these things that I could do where I would interact with people through a screen. 
And then I realized that we had the ability to do things like Zoom meetings. Yeah. And so I figured out, you know, I put together like an hour long show that could be done in a Zoom meeting for any number of people. And so, so I'm, I'm going to just like, because I've done it. I'm oh, gonna, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we did that with your, your family. Twice. We did it twice. Right. Um, originally, you were hired for a, 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 com- a small company meeting, or sorry, a, a performance, because it was Zoom. No one was seeing anyone. So this is going to be this fun thing we're going to do during lockdown. And then I was like, that is so cool. I've got this sort of family thing that we normally all get together for that we can't do. And I was like, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I know a guy. I just did a thing. <laughs> And, and it was, it was a lot of fun. It's one of these weird things that you look, oh, we, we all remember sort of the, the new and weird things we were doing during a lockdown, whether it's baking bread or going on walks or the case maybe. But having that experience, I was like, I never thought, and just as you never thought, you're like, I would, you'd have to perform that way. I never thought I'd get to see something like that. And you're like, this is, this is really interesting and different. And I, I had a great time. And so did my family and everyone I was working with. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, no, that's funny. I completely <laughs> blanked on that, yeah. but that was a thing we did. Yeah, and that, because that was almost about a year ago at this point. Two? I would say. Yeah, two. Two? Yeah, 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 quite some time ago. Time time doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. it's all, yeah, who knows? It's a, it's Wibbly, a lawless, wobbly, timeless yeah. Yeah. window we're in. But yeah, so that same experience that you had, I was very fortunate after I put this together and realized, like, this may work. It works. This, this, <laughs> this could be something here. And so I contacted uh, people that were previous clients of mine. And I said, you know, if you're looking for a way to bring people together or, you know, just to give people uh, something fun and exciting to distract them from what's going on in the world, this is what I'm doing. And so that's pretty much what I've done for the past two years in the hundreds of performances at this point. It's funny because Live performance is obviously such a special thing when you're there, you're in the room where the thing is happening. And I quickly found out maybe a dozen shows into doing this that you still could have this incredible connection with people, even though they were, you know, separated by distance and that people were really craving that kind of connection Mm -hmm. and that opportunity to, you know, get together with their families. Maybe, you know, some groups were families, some were individuals but it was very special for me. I remember there was a one particular show I did towards the beginning for, I think around 300 people, um, which imagine 300 people in a zoom meeting. Yeah. That's, like, a, uh, that's a lot. T- t- <laughs> can tiny you see the little, little boxes? Did you, it was yeah. Just like, like, tiny itty bitty. Yeah. No, you can fit like 50 people to a window in zoom. Yeah. So like I scroll to like see who's oh, that's you know, so doing cool. stuff. And then I have like secondary monitors. I have yeah. all sorts of stuff supporting that. Like a big bat cave full of like, yeah. Do you have like a layer in your house that I you do, do this in? My, well, my whole house is a layer first of all, <laughs> but I do, have a designated uh, studio space that I use to do these kinds of things. Um, So cool. And thankfully, because I had a background in, uh, you know, I understood things about video production and all that. um, Because as a magician, you have to like document what you do so you can show it to others. I had enough of an understanding how to put together a studio so I could do this like in a professional manner, right? Um, But yeah, so that show with, I was like 300 people on the back end of it, I got a letter or an email, I should say, from the person who had booked it. And they said, I don't know how you did it, but somehow we all felt like we were in a room together having one big party. Oh my gosh. And like, I read that and as as silly as this might sound, it actually brought like a tear to my eye because that was the goal I was trying to hit that I didn't know if that was even going to be possible. And here I had hit it like within a month or so of doing these. So yeah, even though it's, it's, again, it's different than being live and in the room with people, it still is its own very special thing. So might I ask the largest show you've ever done? The, the largest that I've done, um, in a single group in a, in a meeting online would be six to 700 people. Um, but there have been companies that have had me come back dozens of times because they have huge departments of people like what we're going to do with our marketing department and our it department yeah exactly so yeah so like you could look at that being kind of a whole audience but in a Mm -hmm. single show in a zoom meeting around six to seven hundred people and in person and in person um 2500 to 3000 um and that was uh yeah and for universal studios where i did over 150 shows for that number of people in about a 30-day period so that was intense as well. So, so cool. It sounds like October. Isn't I was going to say, Jeff, <laughs> yeah. can you imagine giving a tour to 3,000 people? I, I can't even. Uh, you, no. 
I mean, I, I guess this 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 was standing on a lecture stage would be yeah. like our but it's, would be the comparable perfor- yeah. yeah. Well, you got millions of people listening to this podcast right now. I, <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> so so the, the the reach is the same. It's just in a different medium. Yeah, just in a just different. Like I mean, after saying. we air this episode, everyone's gonna want to yeah, listen. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I can't. So have you you've done a lot of both in parts. Do you have any um, <laughs> best? So. In Salem, you'd be interacting with tourists. It'd be like, what's your best tourist story? Sure. Like, or uh, horror story ho- yeah. is more like so, it. So best or worst uh, interaction you've had. And if it's in Salem, all the better. <laughs> if it's if it's uh, somewhere else, what, what do you got? Yeah, so, you know, I would say probably one of the ones that, like, I've, I share with people on occasion. I've actually never talked about this publicly, and I won't go Uh-oh. in depth. <laughs> About we it. can change names. I it's fine. Yeah, I, won't go, yeah. I won't go in depth about it, but I will say it because I think it's a uniquely Salem thing. So I think it's appropriate for this podcast. <laughs> I'm excited. Is that people have ever since I was young doing magic in this city uh, come up to me and said things like, you know, if you did this back then, oh, they yeah, would have yeah. killed you for it. <laughs> Like, I'm 13 years old. Oh, my God. They were saying <laughs> you know? it to you when like, you were when a wee like, lad. Little, little. Yeah, oh, my yeah. gosh. So, you don't say that to children. That's how they lose their dreams. Yeah, and then, I, and, you know, people would come up to me and they'd say, you know, what you do isn't real magic. <laughs> you know, I get that one a lot, too. <laughs> but uh, that being said, I certainly have people, you know, I did a show this weekend where somebody came up to me and they said, you know, because I'm doing various things where I'm reading people's minds and creating that kind of an illusion. And, and this lady comes up to me and says, you know, there's somebody I'd like to contact, you know, are you a spe- spirit medium yeah. as well, uh, which I am not. So, you know, I have that conversation that what I do is for entertainment purposes. And while I do draw on all sorts of different disciplines to create these illusions um, that I'm not the person you want to go to for that particular thing. So that's an example of when that conversation goes well. Uh that conversation has also, uh, I shouldn't even call it a conversation, but I did receive an email from somebody basically, you know, saying that I was, you know, doing the devil's work. Of course. And that, um, you know, I should be executed the way the witches were executed and what have you. So, you, uh, they... yeah, so it's, so some people depending, you know, and there's lots of people in the world and um, I, I have to assume by the way this letter was written that this person was not particularly balanced but because I'm in front of people in a public way in the city of Salem doing these kinds of things, I am open to that sort of thing happening. Do you, do you think they saw you or just... I would say they saw me yeah, at somewhere where I was doing something okay. public. And then wrote that in a response. They, they, they didn't... Because you can also get people who just unprovoked. Yeah, just will come out of the way. And you do see that happen on... If I was like a YouTuber and posting lots of YouTube videos, you'd get all sorts of crazy comments yeah. and stuff like that. Um, and I've read them on other magicians' pages and stuff. And it is kind of unbelievable some of the things people say and think when we, you know, it's that funny thing where it's like we go out of our way to make sure people know this is for entertainment purposes. And that's exactly what the devil would want you to think. <laughs> like, it's like you can't, you can't be like when somebody's fixated that they have a particular opinion about what you do, it's very hard They're, to sway yeah, them from that. Yeah, no matter what you say. No matter what you say. And so, do yeah. You, have you ever doubled down on it? Be like, yeah. Yeah, the guy who wrote me that email, I wrote back and I said, please uh, direct all questions to my management at the Satanic Temple. Yes. No, I'm, I'm joking. I didn't, I didn't actually do that. We should, I was going to say we should check Salem. and see that if they got great, some right? correspondence. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure those guys get like, oh, you know I, they So do. much hate you know mail probably. Do. Yeah, of course. But I, I did have a split second of <laughs> thinking that that would be a funny way to respond to this person. And then I was like, I don't have any clue who the, this person knows me. I don't know them. So I'm not going to like, you know, uh, you know play with fire there on that one having a very public job you don't know who you're dealing with so like you don't want to push anyone any further over the edge they could end up at it's a a fine line yeah yeah it is and i'm sure yeah as tour guides you're meeting up with total strangers and dealing with all sorts of nonsense along the way It's, it's one of those things where there's more great people than there are the uh you know the outliers oh absolutely you know the negative people um but you know, you do this for any amount of time when you're dealing with the public, you're going to deal with everything. Is that, there's always that 10%. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I would say that's probably those kind of stories in a nutshell kind of make up the majority of some of the good, the bad and the ugly that I've had to deal with. So 
as a as a Salem long lived resident or you know family local, would you recommend any anywhere? To, what's your favorite place to go? You're, you're going out for a night out in Salem. Where do you go? I'm going wherever you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good answer. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm the same way with sports teams because I don't follow a lot of sports. So it's like, who, who are you rooting for? <laughs> Whoever you're rooting for, buddy. Um, but yeah, if I had to pick a couple places that I think are, are fun spots to be, uh, I have been to the Gulu Gulu Cafe yep. like for years and years. I've done many hours of work at my computer there. Yep. Very comfortable spot. Um, really fun, eclectic vibe. I do like it there quite a bit. Um, I don't even know what the name of the place is now, but it used to be the old spot. It's been like two or three. Uh, the, we just, I just call yeah, it like the, the, the main, main I keep, street. It's main street. I keep calling it the old spot. Yeah. Lo- love it there. Like for an evening later in the day, sort of spot to like sit and grab a bite. This always surprises me when people are surprised to hear this about me, but I love bit bar. Cause I love, have you been to the new location? I have. And I love it. Nice. I, I love, I like video games, video games a lot. Yeah. yeah. So like legend of Zelda. Yeah. Mario, yeah. All these things are, you know, from my childhood. Um, I actually learned to read because I wanted to understand what they were saying in Zelda because my brothers were playing it. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I went to my mom and I was like, I need to learn how to read so I know what's going on here. So this will help you on your way? Yeah, exactly. Right, yeah, yeah. Take this with you. It's dangerous, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, so Bit Bar is like a place where, you know, you could catch me at any random, you know, typically like late night, I might pop in there and play a couple classic games and, you know, wrapping up my day or whatever, but... Yeah, those are a couple of my favorites. There's so many good spots. Like, you yeah, could go down oh, yeah. There's the list. no shortage of good food here. You could go down the list and talk about every single one of them and what makes them special. I will say, you know, during the summer, the rooftop bar at the Hotel Salem is yes. like a gorgeous spot. Also, one of the things I've never done, but I'd like to do, is it, in um, Rockefellers. You know, formerly Daniel Lowe. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. They have a vault that seats two, where yes. you can sit down and have dinner, you and one other person. I like it's yeah. a wine. V- uh, uh, Wine vault, I guess, might be the so it's an old vault. Yeah, but I think they store their wine in there as well, and there's like a table for two. Yeah, and I went in one day and I was like, "What does it cost to rent that space yeah. or whatever?" And they were like, "Oh no, you can just sit in there if that's where you want to be." And I just haven't had an excuse to do it yet, but I think it's like that would be an awesome thing to experience. Yeah, um, but yeah, love you know, love hanging out at the Hawthorne. You know, I've done a bunch of events there. Always beautiful. Always a nice spot to be. Uh, Front Street Coffee Shop actually was where I would meet with um, some of my friends who were magicians growing up. We would do, you know, an hour, two hour, three hour session uh, practicing tricks on each other and trading knowledge and this sort of thing. And none of us during any of that time ever knew that directly across, across the, the street, street there you go. What, was who, what is now Houdini Way, but we never knew the story of Harry Houdini uh, doing his escape from there. It wasn't for me until maybe three or four years ago that I even knew that which like was kind of a mind blowing thing that I've been a magician and grown up here. And I just had never heard anyone. You, you, talk you about were it. literally just practicing feet. Yeah. From 20 feet where Harry Houdini uh, had performed. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that was kind of like a, a mind blowing thing. And of course I had to call my friends and say, guess so what? Cool. Right across the street. So yeah. And of course uh, you mentioned that company party earlier, you know, Emporium 32, yep, yep. not a, you know, not a restaurant, but you absolutely, if you're passing through Salem, have to go check it out because it is like a fully immersive experience with not only is the merchandise great, but like everything about the place is, you know, top shelf. Uh, it is like a Disney quality experience going into that shop. And I really love that. And I want more places in Salem to, to be like that, to have that. Yeah. Cause again, people are coming to the city looking for a magical experience and that store does such a good job of just transporting you into a different world. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that that's like on the list of course. So you said a lot of people are coming to the city, right? This is like a big travel destination. We have people come from all over the world. It's on their bucket list. But for those of us who get to live here every day, where is your escape? Escape. Sure, yeah. So I've been fortunate because I, you know, got to tour around most of America. And so I've been to most of the states. I wouldn't say all of them, you know, in and out of comedy clubs and different venues and what have you. But I would say one of my all-time favorite places is Key West. Oh. oh, look at that. <laughs> you were there recently. Were, were Jeffrey's you? dad no, no, lives my, my, there. My dad, he lived there. He, he's recently uh, moved off the island. Gotcha. I, I was there, I guess, a few years ago to, to help him pack up his stuff. But he moved down there. God, I'm old now. Um, <laughs> maybe 30 years or so now. So for, he lived there for probably about 25 years. Wow. And I would go down there every summer 
Mm -hmm. uh, growing up. And like, just, I mean, I remember like me and my little brother just like literally wandering the streets, just barefoot, um, (laughs) just like chasing chickens and just causing, causing havoc across the island. And then of course, once we were old enough to drink that, that pretty much was exactly Things escalated <laughs> exponentially yeah. from we, there. We, we were still wandering around the island barefoot, causing havoc. Uh, I ooh, I have incredible, incredibly fond memories of Key West. Yeah, I you know would stay at like the Cuban Club right uh-huh. there on the main street, and I love Key West because of the mix of people and the fact that like there's a sense of like lawlessness in the air, but not yeah. in a way that feels like you're in danger. It's just more like. You're going to do what you want to do. I'll do what I want to do. Yeah. Um, and it's like paradise. It's just like a totally beautiful spot. Uh, cheeseburger in, in paradise, I yeah. believe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and you could have like a multimillionaire, you know, sitting right next to a homeless guy, both yeah. eating at the same place and yeah. having a great time and everybody's getting along. And it's just really feel good vibes and really beautiful. Quick aside about the place, though, because this is still a mystery to me this day. Um, there was a restaurant I go into one night. They have what they call a three-sheet poster, which is like an old vaudeville-era golden age of magic term for a poster that's very big. It's like the size of a door, and it's made out of three individual sheets that get you know plastered on the wall next to each other to create one big poster. So it's called a three-sheet. Uh-huh. And um, right in this restaurant, right by the door, they have a giant three-sheet of Alexander, the man who knows, who is like the most infamous <laughs> yeah. mind reader of all times. Uh, and uh, for the, you know, if you don't know who the guy is, he was not only a mind reader on stage, but he was like a murderer and con man off stage. He was kind of a brutal character. Ooh, I love murder. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, this three sheets on the wall, and I could tell by looking at it that it had to be real or it was an extremely good replica. So I asked everybody who worked in that restaurant, what is with this three sheet? Why is it here? And they said, no, the owner ha- owns it. And uh, that's it. That's all we know about it. And so then the next day, I'm back out in front of where that restaurant is and there's a beautiful yacht in front of the restaurant and the name of the yacht is Alex. No, it's prediction, (laughs) which is a mentalist makes a prediction. Uh Right. So when I saw this, I was like, weird like i never was able to connect the dots but i was like i bet the guy who owns that boat owns that restaurant owns the three sheet uh-huh. in the restaurant and is like a magic fanatic possibly yeah like either somebody who has a great obsession or once was an amateur magician or something like that but um or is a very successful mentalist and has been to vegas several times and has cleaned up <laughs> um, i don't know exactly again that's why you couldn't figure out who he is he's sort of you know under the radar yeah yeah yeah, yeah above suspicion so uh that's one of my key west mysteries and occasionally i'll talk to people and i'll be like hey do you know anything about that about that poster in that restaurant so, so, do you remember the restaurant i would be able to figure it out but i don't know it off the top okay. of my head because so. now I'm, I'm gonna ask about it now i'm curious i'm gonna yeah. Uh, yeah i'll get the uh the detail and let you know but it's uh yeah at the very least it was an incredible coincidence. Yeah. Um, but at the most, there's an interesting story to unravel there somewhere. So a little bit of magic. Yeah, exactly. Key West is a magical place. Yeah. It is really a, a awesome spot. And the Conch Republic, as you know. That's a whole nother. Yeah. You could do a whole, <laughs> I, whole uh, hour on the Conch one Republic. One of my most favorite stories ever. Just, it, we don't have time, but just Google. Yeah, Google, Google the Conquer the Republic. Republic. It's a really crazy. They still celebrate it. Yeah, you know, Conquer Republic days. Yep, to this day. And so I've I've been fortunate to be there when they've yeah. celebrated it. It's very Which cool. Is, just throw rotten food at the Coast Guard. So Anton, official magician of Salem. I don't know if this is appropriate or not on a podcast, but can you do a trick for us? Is that possible? Oh, my goodness. We can't let you go without asking for some magic. Command performance. I, I mean, you, know, you, you, you did a trick at the state house. You did it for the city council. I'll take anything. All right. Let's, let me oh, see. he's got a bag. It's like, well, of course it's like, I have like my... It's like your, your briefcase, Jeffrey. It's, it's like a doctor's bag. It's actually quite nice. He's got probably cool stuff in there, though. Oh, oh. Or it's empty. Or it's empty. <laughs> like <yours. laughs> oh, you know, I did bring... Not magic, but I brought fortune cookies. <laughs> Ooh. You know, you never know. I just it's I figured, ironic. You know, maybe we would get to a standstill in the podcast. Oh, and fortune cookies. Hey, I, I want a fortune cookie. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks. I am that person that eats the fortune before I even touch my Chinese. You mean eats the cookie? Yeah, I mean eat the cookie, not yeah. the fortune I mean, itself. You, 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 I eat the fortune too. Just kidding. Just, 
that, that's how you make it real. For, for those who you didn't have know, to eat it, you actually have to eat for it, it to yeah. come true. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so if you don't like it, you don't eat it, and it doesn't come true. Yeah, there yeah. we that's go. Great. I always heard that you're not supposed to pick your own. So let's see. Who wants to go first? I will. Here, I'm gonna. Well, Sarah it. hasn't even eaten. <laughs> right? For like the little, fact, what is, I, I've always been told you can't pick your own, and you have to eat the cookie first. Oh. But that's, again, who, who knows, oh, which gosh. is why I'm eating the cookie. But you, Sarah didn't. I did. You, so you I'm, might, I'm not going to. I'm not going to eat the cookie on the that. podcast. I've never heard that superstition, Jeff, so I'm going to. No one wants to hear anyone chewing. So yeah, be gonna, okay, good, good, I'm good. Gonna <laughs> eat, I just heard you have to eat the cookie, and so I'll just eat it later. Yeah, we it's don't. It's going to be just as good. My fortune says, there is nothing final about a mistake except it's being taken as final. Ooh, oh, I that, like that. That's, that's quite good. I thought it fits pretty well in what we're talking about. Yeah, I like that one. Can I, can I pass? <laughs> no, no, no. You have can to. You, you have to, to share. <laughs> okay, I'll. <laughs> okay, here we go. Compose myself. For true love, question mark, send. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hold on. It gets better. Send real roses preserved in 24 karat gold. Wow, that is a very specific direction, I, fortune cookie. Are you going to eat it? No. <laughs> I don't want that to come true. That's, that's so a lot you, of gold. So what could that mean? That like you want to send something that's of a sentimental nature, but do it in the most meaningful way possible? Is that I don't, what that could I mean? I don't know what that... We'll, we'll just throw that one on the table. <laughs> I don't think mine's much better. <laughs> you, you gave me that one, Sarah. I'm blaming you. I want the gold roses. <laughs> This is, uh, yeah, not, not much better, but there's a lesson in this one. It says, uh, cooking is easy. Doing dishes <laughs> is the hard part. I uh, think everyone can agree with that. I mean, I actually think doing the dishes is easier. Yeah. Because I you can't. think so? Yeah. I mean, like, you know, cooking is like, you know, that's its own discipline. It takes, like, some skill. Cleaning stuff. dishes. Creativity. T- takes a little bit because you have to stand there. But, you know, like, one dish wash, dry, one dish. It's not, you're not timed and, and the baking and the boiling and, and the mixing and the, the herbs. and the, You're just, like, wash, clean, done. It's much more simplistic. I'm with you. <laughs> I, I completely agree. So, but anyway. One, so, one out of three fortunes wasn't too bad. Wasn't too not bad. Not too bad. And uh, set the stage here. I see a gold Zippo and what looks like an Altoids tin with a what would be a Ouija board print or a, a, a talking board print on the, on the cover. Can you just follow me everywhere and narrate? <laughs> that I, do? I mean, I'll charge you for it, but... So uh, you can tell everybody what my lighter says. It says, trust no one. Do you know what that's a reference to? No. So it's, uh, do you know what it's a reference to? No, but I feel like I should. Yeah. It, you might immediately know it when I say it, but um, the X Files. Oh, Ooh. yeah. So I, my older brother is a big X Files okay. fan, and so uh, the, throwback, the, the very smoking nice. man who was always lurking in the background. You know, he always yeah. had the, the trust no one yeah. thing here. Well, let's see what else I got here. Uh, you might be familiar with these, Jeff. No, that would be more up my alley. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we're looking at a pack of uh, zigzag papers. Yeah, yeah. I like to refer to them as magic papers uh, for for doing magic. Well, were, were, were you saying that in reference to um, spending time in England or? Oh, I don't know. People use these for different things. So okay, okay. I just uh, didn't, you know. In England, they tend, or especially students and whatnot, tend not to buy prepackaged cigarettes. They roll their own. That's incredibly, in Paris and probably most of Europe, uh, that's pretty common. But anyway, a paper. A paper, and um, I'm going to put your name on it, Jeff. Shit. That's okay. <laughs> All right, hold that for a moment. Okay. And... Uh, just do me a favor, Jeff. I want you to think of your your childhood and you know anything from your childhood that you know might have been anything of uh, you know that you really liked from your childhood or anything like that. It's a, a, a positive childhood. Yeah, yeah, positive childhood, like things you enjoyed. Okay, okay. So, okay, we're gonna take Jeff's name here. We've struck the Zippo, the flame of truth. So, ooh, let's see. Oh. Did that just turn into a Lego? <laughs> there you go. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> Tell everyone what you're looking at. I, I'm looking at a small treasure chest, um, a, a Lego treasure chest with a, a, a gold cup, a sword, a, a piece of gold, and a a, a letter that, that says, uh, of course, 
uh, to <laughs> my name, uh, Jeff, you are the magic uh, from Anton. Oh, that's cute. Um, uh, it's, uh, clever, <laughs> sir. Can you see, is he crying? No, I think there's a small twinkling in small the corner twinkling. of his eye. Yeah. I think he's fighting it, but it's yeah. there. I can see it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, well, for those of you listening uh, who are unaware, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Lego. I used to have Lego a lot as a kid. Uh, I still have a lot of Lego as an adult. Uh, it, it inspires imagination and creativity uh, just from like the smallest sets to, to some of them, the massive larger ones. Uh, it's building and play and fun. And uh, he was like, think of something from your childhood. And I was like, oh, I like Lego. Wait, is that really what you were thinking? Of? Yeah, I was thinking of Lego. You're kidding. No, <laughs> I'm a little annoyed. <laughs> I, I am both impressed <laughs> and annoyed. Um, yeah, no, I was I was thinking of Lego. So, uh there you go. Stunned silence. Wow. <laughs> so, okay, that, that, is, that is appropriate. Totally appropriate. Thank you. And, 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 and Thank so you. is. <laughs> Perfect. Well, yeah, there you go. A little, uh, little childhood moment. There we go. Thank that was you. inspiring. Of yeah. course, yeah. Um, so, anyway. <laughs> Jeff is in recovery mode from magic. I think he's going right to be thinking now. about Sarah, this you, you for this. a I'm long just time for a to minute. come. You can, you can, yeah. You're going to be okay? Yeah. That's all. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll I'm wondering good. what mine would have been. We'll have to invite him back. Ooh, yes. You'll you'll and, do it. And, and do it again yeah. and, and, and see see what's going on there. I like it. I like <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm holding you to it next time you come. Absolutely. <laughs> he's like, oh, under pressure. And bring more fortune cookies, too. Yeah, that oh, yeah, for sure. That was a lot of fun. Is that something that you bring to, like... I, Break I've been, ice. At, I've been known um, <laughs> to bring them to parties and stuff. And the reason why is like my mom and I, my dad is not a fan of uh, Chinese food. And so when he would go out of town, it would always be a special thing for my mom and I to go. And the fortune cookie part at the end, you know, is part of that ritual and right. was always so much fun. And so I just, you know, I have a supply of them. And so I will bring them places just because, yeah, they're fun. And who doesn't like a fortune cookie? Right. I also unless it tells you that, something bad. Says, yeah, yeah. <laughs> unless it tells you to, to, to go buy a dozen red roses. Which dip them in gold. Anyway, and dip them in gold. <laughs> I like it because, you know, fortune telling is such a major part of what Salem's yes, all about. Yes. And uh, I think like fortune cookies are the kind of the most accessible form of fortune telling. You end up sometimes with great nuggets of wisdom uh, from those little paper scrolls in there. Yeah, like who can't say they, as you're breaking that cookie, you hope that yeah, there's a good yeah. fortune. You hope that it's going to come true. It's part of the magic. Exactly. Do you mind if I leave your listeners with a thought? Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, do you have anything you want to plug? Anything you want to promote, say? New projects. In, in our show notes, I'll have a link to sure. wherever. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you're listening and you are on the gram and you just want to connect with me, you can go to at official magician of Salem. It's where I post uh, you know, things of a magical nature and as they relate to Salem and my work as the city's magician. Also, if you are somebody listening and you would like to have some entertainment for an event you're doing, whether it be virtual or in person, you can certainly reach out to me through my website. That's AntonPresents.com. That's where you can learn about, you know, my offerings in that area. Uh, so yeah, either way, those are two great ways to connect with me. And I always like... Uh, meeting new people and having fun. That's just about all we got today. Thank you so much for it, joining us. Of course. It was a pleasure to be here with both of you. And, and I'm wonderful so, having you. Thank you. And I'm so excited to see what unfolds with your adventure in this podcast and uh, being privy to some of your secretive plans. I'm very excited to see where they go. And I know you've got some big things coming. So it's a great honor for me to be here on as your first interview. So I was going to say, thanks for being our guinea pig. Of you were an awesome guest. Well, you know, I do believe one of the ways that you experience magic in life is to put yourself in positions where things can surprise you because surprise is, is a feel is deeply connected to magic. So kind of being the first is fun and magical for me. You, you've set the bar. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Real low. I'm going to be <laughs> expecting fortune cookies from all of our guests. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're a guest on the podcast, bring treats. Yes, yeah, um, please. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> But for everybody listening to the podcast, obviously, uh, everyone appreciates your, your time and attention in, in listening, and we hope you have as much fun listening as we do uh, doing the podcast. I want to just reiterate this one thing, um, which is that 
like I said before, you know, our thoughts, you know, shape our actions, which shape the world that we live in. And each and every one of you listening right now have the ability to change your life, the lives of those around you and the world. And in a very real way, you are the magic. So that's the thing I want you to remember. Thank you so much for having me here. Well, on that note, <laughs> thank you for listening to Salem the Podcast. On our next episode, we've got a little more magic for you. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the TV show Bewitched. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and tell a few friends while you're at it. Check out our socials. Uh, that is at Salem the Podcast. That's uh, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. Any questions, feel free to shoot us an email, hello at Salem the Podcast. And of course, if you're visiting Salem and want to take a tour with either myself or Sarah, the links to both those companies are in the show notes. Thanks for listening. See you later. 